Okay, good morning. Yes, we give thanks once again to the Lord for his uh, marvelous grace and opportunity to learn of his word. And uh, I know that uh, the Lord is going to speak to us and uh, everything we do will be for drawing closer to him. So I'd like us to pray and then uh, look at uh, some topic as we continue in the series of justification. Our Heavenly Father, I uh, just say thank you so much for this morning, Lord, for gathering us as a family, both those who are here physically and those who are watching over and listening all over the world, that uh, we may be one big family preparing, Lord, for the second coming of thy son. We want thy spirit to work on our minds, that our life may be transformed. We may continue beholding thee in thy glory, see our wretchedness, and run to the savior of our salvation, uh, of our souls. Help us to seek thee while there's still time for there is coming a time when uh, finding you will not be easy. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we see the events of this world happening, our hearts may be prepared that we may not faint as others faint of what is coming to happen in this world. And so bless us this moment as we read your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, yesterday we looked uh, at uh, justification, good news, and uh, the first promise, the first prophecy that uh, was given to humanity. This morning, I want us to look at uh, justification, conditions of acceptance. Justification, conditions of acceptance. And uh, how I pray that uh, the Lord uh, will uh, really inspire our minds and our hearts to the truth. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, some statement here. Where actually we're talking about the part of man in justification. I, I'd like to look at uh, Amazing Grace, page 390, paragraph three again. This is a, a wonderful statement, Amazing Grace AG, 319.3. We are looking at the topic, justification, conditions of acceptance. AG 319.3 says, God calls up upon all who will who will to come and bring of the waters of life freely remember we are talking conditions of acceptance and justification the power of god is the one element of efficiency in the grand work of obtaining the victory over the world the flesh and the devil it is accordance it is in accordance with the divine plan that we follow every ray of light given of god Man can accomplish nothing without God, and God has arranged his plan so as to accomplish nothing in the restoration of the human race without the cooperation of the human with the divine. Now listen to this point. The part man is required to sustain is immeasurably small, yet in the plan of God, it is just that part that is needed to make the work a success. So you find that uh, in the condition of acceptance and justification, the part that man is required to do is uh, immeasurably small, but that is the part that actually Christ needs. We are told, is it in the book of Jeremiah? Let us look at the book of uh, Jeremiah and I'm giving you the chapter, right? Wait, Jeremiah.
Jeremiah chapter 13. I like uh, us to go slowly and in understanding. Whatever I lose you, you can please raise your hand and we look at the issue once again. Jeremiah chapter 13, are we there? Verses 23. So can Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Is that possible? No, 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 that is an impossible thing. An Ethiopian cannot change his skin or the leopard his spots. But uh, is it possible with God to change these things? Yes. So what is the condition here in justification? Isaiah chapter one. Isaiah chapter one, verses 18 to 19, to 20. Isaiah chapter one, verses 18, 19 and 20. We are looking at the conditions of justification, conditions of acceptance and justification. Yes, go ahead. Come now, let us reason together, says Lord. Amen. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, Shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, Brother Kalama, look at verse 19. If you are willing and obedient, obedient to what? Yeah. <laughs> to the law. L A W. No, that's where we miss. Yeah. Remember, we are talking about conditions of acceptance and justification. to come and reason with him. He doesn't say, change yourself and come, obey the law and come. That is not the condition, obey the law and come. The condition is, come, let us do what? Reason together, although your sins are as what? As scarlet, they'll be what? He doesn't say that become white as snow and then come. He says, come and then I'll reason with you. That is the condition in justification. He doesn't say, go change yourself and come back. You, you have a sports as a leopard. Go be white or go be black, then come. We reason together. He said, no, no, no. You are a sinful person. You look like a scarlet. And that is what I want, come. After you come, I know what I'll do with you. After you come, what happens? You, 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 although you, you be like crimson, you shall be as white as snow as wool also, is it? Yeah. So if you are able to change yourself, why should the Lord tell you, come? There is no reason of telling you, come, if you, you can change your situation. There is no reason for the Lord telling you, come. Look at Isaiah 55. These are simple verses. Every time we read them and uh, we miss the concept of justification, the condition in acceptance. Isaiah chapter 55. Look at uh, verse 1 to verses 5. Yes, right. That 
Now, th th there are things which are being spoken in these verses. It says, hearken uh, diligently unto me. What is this hearkening about? What are you hearkening to? We have hearken diligently and incline your ear. What are you hearkening and inclining your ear to? To these beings come with money? No, without money, is it? Yeah. Conditions of acceptance in justification. Whatever you have to do, you remember the first quote that the part that man has to do is immeasurably what? Small, but that is only what God does what? Needs. And which part is this? Which immeasurably small part is God wanting? You listen to him what he's saying and just do what he says. People always think that uh, they can come to a point that they can make themselves a little better before they are accepted in the Lord. He says, no, you, you'll come the, the way you are and then I'll be able to do these things that are really stressing you up. And so we, we, we must hearken to the Lord. And uh, I like to look at something also. Um, I'd like to give you this. I think it is in selected messages. The parable of the lost sheep. I want us to look at uh, one SM from page uh, 389 as we are looking at uh, the conditions of acceptance in justification. And uh, I'll read it slowly so that uh, we may be able to understand it. We look at the what the Bible says and we look at inspiration and see if uh, actually it's saying the same thing. One is same from 389.2 to 391.1. I pray that these sessions really brings blessings to our, our lives and uh, brings a renewal. It uh, brings in a new zeal and uh, a new aspect of looking at God and a new aspect of looking at Christ. 389.2. Should I go ahead and read? Many have a, a nominal faith in Christ. What is nominal faith? Sometimes we speak of words that uh, we don't understand. What is nominal? Huh? Mm -hmm. Something that is particular, but it's not actually that thing. It's just a profession hmm, that you understand something, but you don't understand anything. So some have this nominal faith. But they know nothing of that vital dependence upon him, which appropriates the merits of a crucified and risen savior. Of this nominal faith, James says, now, uh, see how James describes nominal faith. Okay, are we together? Yeah, let us not be distracted. Those children, they need us more. Of this nominal faith, James says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doeth well. The devils also believe and do what? Tremble. That is nominal faith. The devil has what? 
nominal faith. Nominal faith is a faith which is not transformative. It cannot transform anyone. You just believe something is true, but um, you don't accent to it by your daily living. That is nominal faith. Mm -hmm. Like many people know that, uh, and uh, I will not make this an issue that meat causes cancer. Do they stop eating meat? They continue taking it. Mm -hmm. Even go ahead and take even the animals that no, they have died when they are having diseases. They have that is a nominal faith that you know that meat causes cancer, mm -hmm. but uh, the experiential knowledge of knowing that meat causes cancer is not there because you don't act upon the information you have. If I know that meat causes cancer and I still take it, it means that I'm not acting upon the information I have. I have a nominal knowledge of what is true. So James says that the devils believe there is one God, but they tremble. But what next? But will thou, O vain man, that faith works without works is dead? Many conceive that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, but at the same time, they hold themselves away from him and fail to repent their sins, fail to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Their faith is simply the ascent of the mind and judgment to the truth. But the truth is not brought into the heart that it might sanctify the soul and transform the character. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, then he called and, and whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. Romans 8, 29, 30. Calling and justification are not one and the same thing. The condition of justification is the calling. He calls. Your work is to do what? to answer, to respond to the call, is it? And then that is, and justification are not the same. And then same thing, calling is the drawing of the sinner to Christ. And it is work wrought by the Holy Spirit upon the heart, convicting of sin and inviting to repentance. So that calling invites. Can he then make you whole without you responding to come? That is a forced religion, is it? It's like making a person a puppet. So the condition of acceptance is you to hear the call and listen to what she says. Many are confused as to what constitutes the first steps in the work of salvation. Many people are confused to what constitutes what? The first steps to work of salvation, is it? Repentance is thought to be the work the sinner must do for himself in order that he may come to Christ. People think that what precedes salvation is for you to repent and then you are accepted in Christ. Do you think that is the case? Personally, you think so, and that is how the children see it. If you wrong your mother, what next? Approach your mother and tell her, I'm sorry. And then the mother accepts, is it? Is that how the mother should be behaving? That is the erroneous views of what is justification. That because this is how we see justification, we carry it even into the family life. When a child does wrong, until that child tells you, hey dad, I'm so wrong, I'm so, I'm so sorry for what I have done, you will never treat that child as if the child is guiltless. Is it? But is that true love that awaits A reciprocation before person is accepted. The, the Lord doesn't work like that. He says, they think that the sinner must procure for himself a fitness. You know, when the child comes and tells you, you know, dad, I'm sorry for what I have done. The child is trying to make himself fit for you to accept him. Is it? Mm. Yeah. But should a parent wait for a child to make himself fit so that he accepts that is the child? No. Just by a show of love will even lead this child to a greater or a deeper repentance. You see, when a child comes and says, parent, I'm sorry that I've done you wrong. You know, the child may be saying that because he fears you will kill the child. Cindy, but what if you shown great love and even behaved like nothing happened? And this child tells you, I'm sorry. What do you feel even as a dad? 
it's not the same way you feel when the child comes to tell you, I'm sorry, because you will punish the child. In fact, when somebody comes and tells you, I'm sorry, when you have shown a great love, the way you feel in the heart is so different. You feel moved. Eh? And you won't even in the future think of uh, treating this person according to what they have done. You know, if we want to show people that we have not really forgiven them or we don't understand what is repentance and forgiveness, it is how we deal with them after some time after they have even said sorry. You will hear some parents, yesterday I forgave you, is it? Today again I forgive you. I'm giving you one, one last chance and then you will understand I'm your parent. Very normal, is it? That is, and this is the ideas we carry into justification and condition of acceptance before other people. So the child will be so careful in what it does because it has only one. That is righteousness by works. There's nothing there like righteousness by faith. The child is working his own salvation by his own effort because he fears what will follow that day. And you know that this child will be prone to make even more mistakes and hide them because he knows how he will deal with it. But the child who has been forgiven truly from the heart because of the love the parent has shown, this child will make least mistakes in life. Because before a child does anything, he doesn't reason of the punishment, he reasons of the love that the father or the mother has. And so, so we are told, but while it is true that repentance must precede forgiveness, for it is only the broken and contrite heart that is acceptable to God, yet the sinner cannot bring himself to repentance or prepare himself to come to Christ. Except the sinner repent, he cannot be forgiven. But the question to be decided is to whether repentance is the work of the sinner or the gift of Christ. Is repentance the work of a sinner or the gift of Christ? It's a gift. We take it as the work that somebody must do for him to gain a favor. Is it? Yeah. And how does repentance come as a gift? Do you know how the repentance comes as a gift? The love that the father has for his erring children. And so that love, when it goes out, it goes out as a, a wooing, a, a spirit to bring somebody into repentance. It is, that love is like a magnet that really pulls the, the sinner back to God. That is how it comes as a gift. Repentance comes as a package of love. It comes with that package of love that makes the sinner see, hey, what I have done before the eyes of the Lord is not the right thing. With this such a love, how, how have I done this? And, and you see that heart of contrition, the sinner is speaking to himself. This kind of love, how have I gone against it? And that is the drawing of the spirit. And so we are told, must the sinner wait until he is filled with remorse for his sin before he can come to Christ? Must we wait to feel so remorse before we come to Christ? The very step, first step to Christ is taken through the drawing of the spirit of God. As a man responds to the drawing, he advances toward Christ in order that he may repent. So the love draws him, conditions of acceptance. The sinner is represented as a lost sheep and a lost sheep never returns to the fold unless it's sought after and brought back to the fold of a shepherd. No man of himself can repent. And so in Acts chapter five, verse 31, let us go to Acts chapter five, verse 31. Are we still together? Yes, Acts 5.31. Acts 35, 5 verses 31. Somebody there, please. <coughs> so, 
So Christ gives what? Repentance and then what follows? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. He has justified us. He has died for us vicariously on the cross. And then he gives the gift of repentance. And so we are drawn to him by his unconditional love. You will find those statements that E.G. White says about uh, being obedient to the law. But being obedient to the law, it is not the condition of acceptance. Being obedient to the law, it is a fruit of acceptance. Because it is only after we are accepted in Christ and we have come to him that actually the works reproduce themselves. So obedient to the law is a production of that acceptance already. We are accepted in him. After we are accepted in him, then we become one. And then, like, uh, th think about this to married couples. Um, do the wife or the man looks look like uh, the couple after marriage or before marriage? Matron, did you get that or it passed? I'm asking this. Did you look like some after marriage or before? After. So you must be one first before you reproduce, is it? That is the thing. We must come to Christ first before we reproduce the works of the law. You cannot reproduce the works of the law if you are not one with the person who is the owner of the law. Christ is the embodiment of the law, is it? And it is only in him that you can look like him. Apart from him, can you reproduce the works of the law? No, they will not be like him because you are not one with him. And so we come first, accepted in the sun. And then when we continue getting us assimilated to his character, we reproduce what is his character. You cannot reproduce the character of Christ outside Christ. And if you can do that, then that is false. Because it's only after you become one that you reproduce of the same kind. And so we find that uh, the way of being made righteous is always given prominence when we read the Bible. And uh, this issue of justification now comes so clearly in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. How this righteousness, acceptance, and reproduction of righteousness is gotten. First of all, they just have to live by faith. It is always by faith, and then what follows is the works. And so Paul says that I'm not, yes, Brother Kalam. John chapter 6, verse 44, we go there quickly. John 6, 44. <coughs> The book of John, chapter 6, verse 44. It says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last days. Yes. Yes. Can this Bible class now be applied as a gift? Yes, and yesterday we were looking at uh, when man sinned, he ran away. But now the condition of acceptance is that God does not wait for us to make us self-fit. He comes for us and by the wing of the spirit. And so no man can come to me except the father which sent me draw what him. It is the work of the spirit of God in drawing men unto himself. He says that if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto, unto myself. So the condition of acceptance is that God draws. You hear that call, child, I want to make you clean, the drawing of the spirit, and then you come the way you are. 
like now Adam is asked, where are you? And he said, I'm hiding. He said, Christ is like telling him, come forth from where you are. I want to speak to you and how we can deal with this thing. And that is the drawing of the spirit. In fact, when you read Genesis, it says that uh, they heard the Lord walking in the midst of the garden. When you look at the Hebrew strong concordance, it's like it was a wind blowing. And uh, they knew what was happening because the coming of the Lord like was like that wind blowing and they knew something was wrong. And so the spirit drew them to God. They knew you cannot face God without that glory that had disappeared. But Christ now had intervened between the father and humanity and said, no, we can work out this. And so he draws them back so that they may know that he is for them, not against them, and they can work out. And so no one comes to the father except he draws him. And I'll raise him up at the last day. How does he raise him up? Now the fruit of the spirit has seen that this person has accepted Christ. You live in him uh, uh, and you rise with him. You die with him and you rise with him. In him we live, we walk and do everything. And so uh, the, the same thing, uh, actually it can be applied to John 14, 6. That uh, I'm the way, the truth and life, no one comes to the father, but so Christ now stands in as a mediator. And so we are accepted in the son. You see that? Accepted in the son. God made it so that in his son we be accepted. And then through the son again we live the fullness of the life of the father. We saw yesterday how the, 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 the circuit of beneficence, is it? From the great source of all, the father. Desire of Ages, page 21, paragraph 2. It flows from the father to the son. To the believer now, from the believer to the son to the father. And so that is the circuit of beneficence. In the son we are accepted. In him we live. And as we look at him, as we draw closer to him, <clears throat> we come to be just as he is. I think it is in Acts chapter 2, which says that God has shed his spirit abundantly unto us through his son. Where is my Bible? It's in Acts chapter 2. Let me find a verse. Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 33. Somebody read Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Thank you so much. Yes, therefore, my readers went to sleep. Therefore, yes. Being by the right hand of God, exciting and having the spirit of the Father, the God, <coughs> had sent forth his and prayer. And then go to uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus 3. Verse 5 to 7. Not by works of righteousness which is done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Yes. By the washing of the generation and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he spread on us abundantly through Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, according to the hope Amen. Amen. That is the thing. He draws us. Those are the conditions of justification, uh, the conditions of acceptance. And then he changes because we are like a, a leopard with spots. And so, as we were saying, is that they just shall live by faith. You don't want have to make yourself fit to be accepted in the Son. He, in, in the Father, through the Son, we are actually accepted. So it is the gospel that reveals to men the perfect righteousness of God. The gospel also reveals the way that righteousness may be obtained. And uh, as we see that uh, by the deeds of the law, no man shall be justified before God. In Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 23. The Lord draws and the Lord changes. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And so if the, the works of the law are being reproduced in your life, it means victory over sin. If the law condemns you, it means that uh, you have not come to that point 
where actually you have overcome sin, is it? But Romans chapter eight verse one says that there is no condemnation to those who are in, in Christ Jesus. Why there is no condemnation? The victory, they walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So it means that Christ is working in them. Paul says that I'm crucified with Christ who lives in me. That is the thing. Christ living in you is the reproduction of the law. You cannot reproduce the works of the law without Christ living with them. And so we just appreciate what the Lord is doing for us. It is through faith in the blood of Christ that all the sins of the believer are canceled and the righteousness of God is put in their place to the believer's account. And so he says that in due time, when we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. And when we look at how Abraham was justified, uh, the book of Romans chapter four, let us look at Romans chapter four. Conditions of acceptance, justification. Romans chapter four. Are we there, amen? Start from verse one. <clears throat> Chapter four from verses one. Romans chapter four. Yes. Continue. Look at verse four once again. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but us. It's a wage that uh, the Lord owes you because you have done something good, is it? Yeah. But now verse four, read verse four, Ray. Yes. Continue. Yes. Now look at verse five. Are we together? It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, that is Psalms 32. Blessed is a man whom God does not count upon his iniquity. Saying, verse 7, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, let us look at verse 9. Because we are, look, we are, we are trying to, to see the conditions of acceptance. Look at verse 9. Pray, read it. Verse 10. Then it says, How was faith reckoned to Abraham then? Yes. It's talking about works and faith. And faith stands for uncircumcision, and work stands for circumcision. Is it? We understand that? Yeah. Yes. And so the Lord is asking all of us, was Abraham reckoned righteousness or righteous after circumcision or before circumcision? <clears throat> was it after the reproduction of the works of the law or before that? 
before. Because the Bible is so clear that he was reckoned before circumcision, is it? Mm-hmm. And then look at what he says in verse 11. This is how the gospel is beautiful. Because many times we urge people who are unconverted to do things that are only supposed to be done by converted people you know that have you ever found people telling other people to dress well and they are not converted is it somebody has not reformed in health and you are telling him not eat this and drink that and so salvation becomes something so difficult to a person who is unconverted have you ever realized that that when somebody is unconverted salvation is a burden yeah Christianity is a burden to people who are unconverted. But if you are converted, who is working in you? Christ in me, working to will and to do of his own pleasure. And you will not find, you know, I find it uh, so weird that we can say Christianity is a burden. Who is the author of the law? Christ himself, is it? And when he lives in you, who do you expect to keep that law? Christ himself, is it? In you, keeping the law. And so how can it be a burdensome for himself, Christ, to keep the law? Can it be a burden for Christ to keep the law? No, it is not a burden to him. That is why when he is in you, it is simpler to keep the law than you trying to keep the law without Christ. And so he says in verse 11, of you can use you, you fear reading because you don't you have an IV. The other sound. That is King James. You use this there if you fear Lord. Verse 11 of Romans chapter 4. Yes, sister. Yeah, and that is the thing that uh, circumcision, the works of the law, is it? Is a seal of righteousness by faith. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. And so the works that we do are a fruit of who we already are. We reproduce the works of the law because we are Christian, Christ-like. Christ in us is working. So the condition of acceptance in the Lord is to accept that calling, the wooing spirit. God does not wait for us to make ourselves fit before we are accepted. And so Romans chapter 4 brings it out, out clearly. And as, yes, a seal of acceptance. Because he says, show me, James says now, show me your faith and I show you what, what the works. Huh? For faith without work is dead. So no one can come to Christ and remain the same. Why will it be important? Of what profit will it be for you to remain the same after you have come to Christ? There is no profit, is it? That is why if, if really there is no change of life when we come to Christ, then let us live in the world and accept to go to heaven. Let us live like worldlings, is it? If there is no change after we have come to Christ, is there any reason for being a Christian? No, there is no reason for being a Christian. And so the people who say that uh, now it doesn't matter what I do after I have come to Christ, is that true? It matters a lot, is it? Yeah, you cannot say it doesn't matter what, what I am and you have come to Christ then go back to the world and be like the world. So when you come in Christ, it's like saying like this, Sister Flora, that it doesn't matter what I do with other men while you are married. Is it? 
It matters what you do when you are married. It matters what I do if I'm married. I cannot go around with other women and I'm married. In fact, it is wrong for me to go with other women if even I'm not married, unless I'm a worldling, is it? Yeah. And so when we come, we become married to Christ. We just, do you know that is what it means to become one flesh? Because now we just look like the bridegroom. The bride has to look like the bridegroom. Look at this, Revelation chapter 19. When we come to Christ. Verse 7 to Revelation, yes, 19, 7 and 8. Okay. Yes. Let us be glad and rejoice. One of him, the marriage of the Lamb's house, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed with fine linen, in fine linen, clean and white. Fine linen is the righteousness. Yes. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Who granted that? Who gave that permission for her to be in linen, clean and white? Yes, the bride groom provided the dress for the bride. And so we are accepted in the sun and then he makes us whole again. So fundamental is this way of righteousness that the apostle goes on to say, even David describes the blessedness of the man who uh, unto whom God imputed the righteousness without works in Romans chapter 4, quoting Psalms chapter 32. And so the law of God demands righteousness, but we cannot meet the conditions of righteousness outside Christ. First of all, he draws us, and then in him, we are made whole. We are accepted in him, and we are made one with the Father once again. To him, Christ, God put the sins of the world. As we see in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So that in him, we may be accepted. And so, how do we meet these conditions of acceptance? It is accepting the voice of the shepherd. And this voice says, come unto me ye who are heavy laden. And I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. Our work is to accept the call. After we accept the call, then he makes us whole again. So, let us be glad that uh, the Lord does not require of us some grievous thing to be accepted. He knows how we are weak. He knows how we are afraid. But as we hear his voice every now and now in response to it, he is able to change our sports. He is able to change our filthiness. Christ came to this world as our redeemer, he became our substitute. He took our place in the conflict with Satan and sin. He was tempted in all points as we are, but never sin. He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And you remember the, 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 the promise it's in Genesis 3.15? I'll do what? I'll put an enmity. It is him who promises. Did we promise Christ anything? The last time man promised to do anything for God or for Christ, he failed. Do you, re you remember that time? The journey in the wilderness? All that the Lord has said, how, how long did it take before they made the golden calf? Before Moses came down, it had not lasted 40 days, is it? Yeah, yeah man could not endure even 40 days of obeying God. Imagine, he was not even given one year to obey God. 
Man told God, whatever you have said, I'll do. But a month did not last. At, at the wilderness, they had food, they had everything. So they didn't have any reason for making a golden calf. But in that abundance of what God had provided them, man says that in this Moses, he has gone and we don't know what has happened of him. Make us gods that we may go back to where we came from. And where are they going back? To purity? No, they are going back to Egypt. And what is in Egypt? Every filthiness, is it? Yeah. And so man cannot promise God anything. It is only the promises of God that works. Man can only be saved in the conditions of Abraham. And the condition of Abraham is this. God is the one who promises. Man cannot promise anything to God. Let every man be a liar and God remain what? True. Yes. According to the book of Romans. And so uh, in this divine transaction, God receives pardons, justifies, and loves him, the sinner, as he loves his son. Only what God hates is sin, and he will remove it. And that is why he bids you come, so that I may remove what I hate you. I don't, I, I don't want to remove you. I want to. And so his work is come. He calls. There is the conditions of acceptance in justification. And so it's a great privilege that we have that uh, we don't have to think that we have to make ourselves fit for acceptance. And then finally, after we have come, the Lord makes us just look as him. You remember first John chapter one. Let us go to these beautiful verses. Chapter three, sorry. <clears throat> first John. Three. Verses one, two, three. And every man that hath his this hope in him purifies himself even as he is and god has promised that we shall see him as he is because when he appears we shall be like him colossians chapter 1 verses 27 <clears throat> the hope of glory christ in you the hope of what of glory i in them you in me i in them and they in me that is what christ says go to colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 to 4 so Christ is our life, is it? This is the blessings. Christ is our life. Apart from him, we do not have life, but with him, we have life. Which kind? What, what kind of life? Eternal life in Him. That God manifested His Son, that He may give us His life. 
And he says that I have come that they may have life and a life in abundance. If the sun sets you free, then what? You shall be free indeed. So the only way to heaven is through the covenant that God made with Abraham. And these are the promises. But many miss the mark. Many miss these beautiful promises that the Lord has provided for us. And I like to say righteousness by faith is not a theory. People may hold a theory about it, but this is an experience that we must have. If really we have received his life, whoever says that uh, he knows he must or he abides in him, look at uh, 1 John 2.6. 1 John 2.6. First John chapter two verse six. First John chapter two verse six. Yes. Whoever says that Christ in him must do what? Walk. You cannot say you have been accepted in the Son and remain the same. You must walk as He walked the fruit of that acceptance will be seen. The condition is calm, but the fruit will be seen by the way you live. And so, righteousness by faith is a transaction of experience. It is a substitute. You know that? You give him his life and he does what? He gives you his life. You place on him all the filthiness you have, and he confers to you all the righteousness he has. And these concepts, we must come to accept them in our lives. Not accent to them by mouth, but accent to them by the way we live. May the Lord be with us and uh, continue teaching us in these sessions. Shall we pray? <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much because in your Son we are accepted. And just how I pray that uh, this may not be a theoretical truth unto us, but it may be an experiential truth that after having the life of the son, we shall not remain the same again. Help us to bear fruit and even much fruit, tenfold, a thousandfold, a hundredfold, according to the measure of faith that you have given unto us. Bless your people, bless your children as we continue learning these things in Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.